Welcome. I thought I'd better wear sunglasses because that's appropriate for the Matrix, isn't it? Uh, you know, I, wanna, I don't want to disappoint you too much because I'm, I'm not Keanu Reeves. Uh, I don't think the influence group could afford to bring him here. I didn't actually send an email and ask him, so uh, I, they took my speaker fee instead. It's, mine's four digits. It's uh, F-R-E-E -E or Z-E-R-O, zero. And, uh, but I, I, it's just a pleasure to be here because uh, I'll take these off now. But, uh, but it's a pleasure to be here because I find this event very helpful for us to get to learn a lot about what's going on in our industry to share ideas and to network. I mean, that's really the value of us coming together in, in so many ways, also meeting uh, sponsors that have helping us to provide us solutions that may move things forward. So today I'm talking about, you know, how do you think about your building resources and moving it to a 10x situation? I think most of us know that it's hard to change behavior, right? But when something is substantial enough, we do it. Uh, we, we take those actions. So I say that because I think there's some breakthrough thoughts, being at this for 35 years, the one thing I'll have to say is the, the, the disadvantage of uh, 35 years of experience, it takes 35 years to get there. And so uh, I want to kind of share with you some of the things that I've come across, just like many of you have done so far, and, and look at what is a digital twin. And, and the reason that that's important, and, and I'll talk to really one of the things that's right before us today, and many of you are dealing with, how do I extend the service life of my capital assets how do I reduce my energy, and how do I deal with ESG, particularly the environmental impact of things at our facility? I'm sure many of you are getting asked that question, so what can I do, what can I afford, and how do I approach that? So I'll talk a little bit about the area of demand response. If you think about demand response in the facilities environment, it's all the things that consume power past the utility meter coming into the facility. This is gonna be a hospital, healthcare facility, and in those that have an air handle unit, it's kind of central to how things work. Uh, most building systems, if they're a hospital, will have a chiller, they'll have a variable frequency drive, they may or may not, they have economizer dampers if you're in an environment that, that it warrants that to be able to put that if it's not too hot and humid. You might, you're gonna have some kind of hot water heating system, steam heating system. I call that kind of the systems of the building that provide and deliver the systems to the other aspects of what I call the environmental side of things. So that's the environmental optimization. And that really involves looking at how are spaces being impacted by the central systems of that facility infrastructure. So as you think about that, you have these air terminal boxes that are fed from your central system. And from that, if you think about there's a very simple schematic of an HVAC system. HVAC systems consume about 45% of your hospital's energy. So it's a great place to start and it's a great place to get that right because it has so many aspects of energy, indoor air quality. It's a very high capital expense. I know many facilities are going through the need to replace their air handler units. Those are expensive. They can cost you anywhere from a half a million to a million dollars each. And so how do you get some service life out of them? How do you spend and invest your money? So uh, you have a system too that ties this all together so you can see what is going on. So what I wanna talk about when we say the idea is what is a digital twin? Uh, that's not particularly new. Actually, a digital twin came into existence during the space program in the 60s. If you remember Apollo 13, if you watched that movie, they had a full built capsule that they were trying to troubleshoot how to provide the solutions in space to fix the problems that they had. So in a way, they were building a, a physical digital twin of the space capsule on Earth so they can communicate that up to space as to what to do. The other thing that you'll, you'll notice is from that period of time, I think many are familiar with CAD or 3D. I think many times we think of digital twin or is, is a 3D image or model. Um, that, is, that is true. I think uh, both uh, BIM and Rivet has given us the ability to look at a, a model or an image or something like that. But I also take the digital twin a little bit further. It's moving away from sort of this 3D idea to more of object-based thinking. And what I mean by that is when you think of the Mars space rover, it takes about eight minutes for a signal to come from the Earth, bounce across the satellites, and eventually get to Mars, and then back and forth. Can you imagine sending commands and it taking you 16 minutes before it does the full cycle? Well, what scientists are doing now is they realize they have to build a complete digital twin of the Mars rover so they know how it will react to various situations as they are happening so it can predict and model and be ahead of that communications lag 
of what is going on. I think that if you, for those of you that have seen the Top Gun movie, I won't be as any kind of a spoiler alert over that movie, but you'll see there a really good example of digital twin in practice where they were going through a simulator to make it feel like they were in the real experience when they were practicing for the real event. And that's what this is about, is how do I get my ability to practice in a safe environment before I apply it into the real world? So let's talk a little bit about how to think about going about this. The reason digital twins are so powerful is you can take the historical data, and the more data is the better for us to analyze and understand what's going on and what's needed to repair. The reason I use the word 10x is because you'll see as I talk about this today how it really transforms how to think about maintenance and capital investment. So you have your, your heating system, and you look at your normal operation. Uh, very common, there's alarm notification, all that today, but could you get ahead of that? Could you understand what is going on with the boiler before there's a problem to fix it and make sure you're always optimizing it? Or for example, how can you test some what-if scenarios? And, and what-if scenarios can be very inexpensive when they're done in the digital twin environment versus doing it physically because you're consuming energy and taking risks to do that. So again, going back to the model that I shared with you earlier, uh, you can kind of think of this as a high-level schematic. How do you apply that? in testing it. As you think about this for a minute, think of an air handler unit. I kind of think of it as the heart of the system of a healthcare building, and that is it is moving the air across the entire building structure, but it's conditioned air, it's ventilation air, and it relies on these things you see in the diagram where you're looking, it has to have chilled water, it has to have all these things I talked about earlier. It, it all interrelates as a system. So Digital Twin is looking at a system and how does it interact together? You know, some people look at how much does it cost to, uh, from an energy perspective, on a kW per ton, that's a common metric used as a KPI in, in energy efficiency for chillers. But you really need to look at just more than just the chiller energy consumption. You have to look at all the pumps, the systems. What does it actually cost to generate the chilled water for that hospital? And what are, what are you doing about trying to look at the overall efficiency and costs associated with it? So you've got the what if, what if scenarios you can look through, plan ahead of time, and, and save, some, uh, save some time to make sure that these things I'm going to implement will work. Again, the, the chiller, uh, when do I need to do maintenance? I mean, the traditional way is we have a service contract. We look at how to maintain chiller maintenance based on some kind of a schedule, um, based on just a routine kind of schedule-based PM. Well, if you think about Digital Twin, you can model that chiller to say, when's the best time I need to service it? So it's more like just in time servicing based on need versus doing it on just on schedule. So these, again, will tell you va variables and data that you can use to figure out, okay, what parts do we have? Uh, what, where we're going with things today is typically if somebody has a problem, they just say, I have a problem with the temperature being wrong, uh, send in a technician to troubleshoot it. So they've got through, through all these things to figure out the problem where it's coming to the point with the digital twin, you can say, what is the things that might happen and how do I respond to it if those were to occur so that I could almost you know, systematically address it with the right parts, services, and pieces to do that. Uh, we can also think about supply chain. If you think about the issues we have right now today, the more time we have, the better to get parts and pieces. So as we know and watch the, the supply chain issues that are going on before us, if we have more heads up notice about a problem or issue, we can get those ordered ahead of time and then and decrease our issues that are associated with escalation costs. A lot more expensive to have an air freighted part in than to order on regular scheduled mail. Uh, also, um, you want to put your maintenance into a whole new place. Let me talk a little bit about this. So there are, there are typical maintenance responses we're all related, we're all familiar with. Here's another one of those Maslow hierarchy uh, pyramids for another example here, but we have the corrective break fix at a facility, which we're very accustomed to having that be the case, right? The other is to um, look at preventative maintenance and that scheduled uh, recurring maintenance that's done in our facilities. Finally, there's what is called predictive maintenance, and that is trying to figure out how it, before it breaks, how to better maintain that asset. And then finally, there's um, moving up to what's called prescriptive, which is real time, that is actually going ahead of and telling the technician exactly what they want to do. So that's, that's the way to think about how do I go through my digital twin process to figure out how do I look at my maintenance and get to that prescriptive level. Now, there's also various risks in healthcare you assign maintenance to, right? There's first going to be related to um, the low-risk items that really, if they break, you can just fix them when that happens. It's a low-risk event. We're all familiar with that. Moderate, not high-risk. 
Then you move into this area in healthcare they call infection control. I kind of think of it almost as high priority. It's the same thing. It's kind of a tag to a high priority need. And eventually there's a highest risk of maintenance that you need to, to address. So as you look at the high risk areas and you then put these two things together, what you have is the idea that on the left side there, you've got the, the, the whole aspect of how you do maintenance versus the risk. And as you look over to the left hand top left corner smart building, the only way that you're going to get into the predictive and prescriptive space is that you're analyzing all your data points from your building system, going back to what I was talking about earlier, the components of how that will look, work, and operate so you can get ahead of it and maintain it. So one of the things I'm doing at, at HCA Health Trust is looking at shared services. So shared services, uh, big enterprise tries to share services across its portfolio of property so that you take advantage of your leverage of economy of scale, right? And so if you think about the traditional maintenance, you can continue to double down and just be a little more efficient, a little more efficient, scale and share my resources, train some people, and that's all good, but you're never gonna make it to the next level, and that is you're going to put it into a intelligent building world that you get there through a, a digital twin kind of concept. And w one of the issues that I found is interesting is that when you think about service technicians, these are technicians that have a, a lot of experience and can service these building systems we looked at earlier. Uh, how do you attract that talent to service that equipment? It's, it's more technologically advanced than it has been in the past. Um, it, the, the resource pool to pull from is small. There's not as many people trained in that space. So the thing that's very important, if you want to attract the technicians, the important thing for you to do with them is to have a system where they can be very, very efficient in their service. Because the more efficient they are in service, the more pr projects, the more areas they can go. So let's, let's face it, the more they can be compensated for the effectiveness of work. So when you talk about shared services, I think the industry is moving to where we have these very special uh, trained individuals that can go in and service these systems with this technology and be very, very efficient. And while their cost per hour might be higher, their effectiveness is so much improved that their total cost is much, much less. So in, in, the, in the world of how to think about where things are transformational in our space, as you think about it, I'll, I'll leave you with just a couple more thoughts here, is that as you think about this investment, try to use your existing digital assets first. All hospitals have a billion automation system of some sort. Uh, though you have digital assets, you have data points in which you have, the question you have to ask yourself is, how do I extract that data? How do I put it into a system? How do I analyze it? to make my maintenance and my process more effective. Because if you do that, then you can think about a couple other things that really leverage that knowledge. First of all, the, uh, the normal response to when a system doesn't work is to typically, after a period of time, just say we need to replace it. We need to replace the air handler unit, for example. Uh, like I said before, it can cost you up to about a million dollars to replace an air handler. Nonetheless, it's hard to get to schedule, install, and all that that goes with it. Whereas, can you extend the service life of your air handler unit? So why, why isn't that being done? Um, a couple of reasons. One is, for example, just basic maintenance on your coil, the coil inside the air handler unit. The, it, over years, it gets to a condition called impaction. So just debris and dirt gets into the middle of this big, thick, wide, eight-row coil. How do we clean all the way through that to restore it more to its original condition? How do we deal with some of the corrosion by cleaning it off? How do we put in some additional controls? Because you really think about air handle, what it is, it's a big metal box with a fan blower assembly with some controls, some actuators, and that's kind of it. I mean, so can you re renovate it in place? Can you take an air handle that from a condition assessment is in the condition of red and turn it into a yellow or a green? But the good news is you can do that for a much less cost, yet you also restore the energy efficiency. So instead of spending a million dollars, you spend 50 to $100,000, have a more intelligent air handler system, and you begin rethinking about that because now you're moving to energy efficiency. So it gets to this big challenge. We need to be more energy efficient. We need to deal with our environmental uh, activities at our facilities. So how do we go about doing that? Invest in your existing assets to extend their service life. Be smart about how to operate those. Track them with the data systems that you have and really extend the service life of that equipment. 
The value, I give you a specific example. We had a, uh, a hospital that thought that they needed to have a new air handler unit. It made sense, the logic was there, but I went ahead and made a personal visit to this location, did an inspection, and figured out that we could do some things to air handler to improve it. Improve it to where it's gonna be a fraction of that cost and save about a million dollars, as I mentioned. Uh, one of the things you also were experimenting with is using dry ice blasting. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that. It's a new technique for cleaning metal materials in which we were trying that with our coils and blasting that through so you can get a really effectiveness in cleaning the coil, cleaning the air handler. So uh, continue to experiment and try new techniques to extend the service life because that is where your, your value is going to be to your CFO. You say, you know, I don't need to have, I'd like to have all new air handlers, but I can't afford it but I can do some things to refurbish my air handlers and my systems to make sure first and foremost, can I spend some money in the beginning to get everything more efficient, invest in my data acquisition, my digital twin and my ability to use software and systems to analyze them and then spend money on capital after that. And then bringing the energy savings to help fund all this, which I've been mentioning along the way. So uh, it's important to, to really think about that twice and, and think that through. My final um, comment or recommendation from what I've come across over the years is that as you look at replacing systems that need to be replaced or addressed, I would suggest coming up with two or three options as to what to mean, needs to be done to fix it. Many times it's, hey, that doesn't work, we need to replace it. True, good op an option, but how could you refurbish it? How do you work through? I think the CFOs are looking for that you have researched the options and the trade-offs with those options. So as they're making decisions, they thought you've done your proper due diligence on looking at that for that, then to have confidence that the decision being made is the best. And, and then finally, I'll leave you with that. It's important that you um, just continually figure out how to get more data out of your systems. You may have to add more sensors. Um, if you think about uh, most of these, you're looking with uh, what I say is sort of the thermodynamic optimization of, this, of the system. And that's really where the, that's in the end, that is where the energy is being consumed. It takes energy to make those things happen. So if you understand them, you can reduce them and have a proactive approach to, to reducing that. Uh, finally, uh, I said that like three times, I think. <laughs> so you don't know, I'm, I got you on your toes. Uh, so uh, I, I, if I have a dollar to invest in something at a facility, and I know there's the issue of should I do it with energy efficiency, demand response, or renewable energy. Uh, I've been in the renewable energy uh, involved with that for 35 years, from selling thermal solar systems in Oregon, which doesn't, the sun doesn't shine very much, to all over. So I, I think solar is fantastic. But for right now, right now here today in the very short term, the fastest thing that you can do is the best thing, and that is how do I reduce energy spend immediately through a process of reducing that because everything that I reduce will then be at an advantage to whatever I have to add from a renewable standpoint. I've heard it said that you know, it's best to lose the weight before you buy the suit, so let us lose the energy first before we augment that with additional solar and think about how to invest that. So over the next year, it will be interesting to see how facilities reduce the energy spend and get better at it. Thank you.